Welcome into the 24-7 Sports YouTube page alongside Chris Hummer. I'm Emily Proud, and with all the ranked and undefeated matchups headed into Saturday, we were primed for some great action, and not only did it live up to the hype, but dare I say, it exceeded it. So Chris is here to give us some winners and losers from Week 7, starting with the biggest win of the weekend, Tennessee 52-49 over Alabama. But Chris, this was more than just a victory for Tennessee. So what did their first win over a Nick Saban-led Tide tell you about these volunteers? I, I don't, I hesitate to say things like its team is back. Joe Tessitore made that very <laughs> dangerous ground in college football. But you have to come away from this game thinking Tennessee is back as a relevant figure on the national college football stage. That's what it means to beat Alabama in this era. Um, I, I don't want to put this out there like saying Tennessee's going to win the national championship, but four of the last seven teams to beat Alabama have went on to win the national championship. Beating Alabama signifies that you can compete for that year in and year out. And Tennessee has pushed its way there. And it's it's a really incredible thing for Josh Heupel in year two for this program to turn around so quickly. They have the odds-on Heisman favorite now in Hendon Hooker, who's playing lights out. And this was just a weight off of the Tennessee program. They got to smoke their victory cigars for the first time in more than 15 years. They carried the goalposts all the way to the river. Um, it was that kind of celebration in Knoxville. And it was a, uh, it was a momentous thing for both Tennessee and college football because it's frankly good to have Tennessee back as a program that matters nationally. Don't be afraid, Chris. You can lean into the hype. It's pretty awesome what Tennessee's doing down in Knoxville. That was quite the celebration that's probably still going today. Meanwhile, Michigan's comically weak schedule to start this season has been really easy to poke fun at, but what they did against a top 10 Penn State team, no joke. 418 yards rushing, that's all I gotta say. Chris, what impressed you the most about how Michigan was able to win this game? Michigan has an identity. We saw that last year. They ran the football well and dominated up front with the offensive line. And with some changes along that offensive front, you thought there might have been a little slippage. Obviously, Hassan Haskins is gone, but they have no problems this year doing the exact same thing. Penn State came into the week as a top 15 rushing defense. They were at allowing less than three yards per carry, and Michigan just shoved Penn State into the ground. Like, that Michigan offense and that offensive line and that running game led by Blake Quorum is something you can count on week in and week out. And I think Michigan, along with a pretty strong defense, has once again established itself as a college football playoff threat. So you have to feel really good about Michigan. You mentioned the comically weak schedule. It really isn't difficult until the game. I think they have Michigan State, Rutgers, Nebraska, and Illinois before they get Ohio State. So the runway for Michigan to an 11-0 start is right there. And I think the game will probably feature two undefeated teams thanks to this win for Michigan over Penn State. Okay, we can look ahead and get excited, uh, but Michigan probably not looking ahead. Just on to the next one. Well, our last winner is the last of these teams to win yesterday. That's Utah. Cam Rising finally showing this season what we knew he was capable of. It's taking everything in me to not say he rose to the occasion. I won't do it, but Chris, what are your big takeaways from this one? Yeah, we mentioned Tennessee in the atmosphere earlier today. The atmosphere in Utah on Saturday night in Salt Lake City was college football at its best. You could literally, through the TV, feel that stadium moving, rocking, and just yelling. Cameron Rising got a little revenge for himself. He obviously ran in the touchdown at the end of the game and the two-point conversion. He fumbled on the goal line against Florida earlier this year to lose that game. So he got his revenge. But really, I just think this is about college football like meaning something to people. Utah had Aaron Lowe and Ty Jordan on their helmets, painted on there last night. Two players who died within the program within a nine-month period between 2019 and 2020. Like, you could just feel the emotion coming off of Utah. This was a massive win for the Utes. It keeps them in the Pac-12 title race. It knocks USC off the top of the perch at the Pac-12. So this game just meant everything. And I think Utah, after two rough losses earlier this season to Florida and UCLA, showed it's still one of the premier teams out west. Yeah, that was very meaningful and, of course, reminds you why college football is so special. Well, it happens every Saturday. Half of these teams do have to lose, so here are a few uh, losers from the weekend. On the other end of a 17-point comeback, an overtime victory for TCU was the team who fumbled away the lead, Oklahoma State. Chris, what would you learn about the Pokes Saturday? 
Yeah, that was a that was a rough one for Oklahoma State. They led by 17 early in, or midway through the second quarter. Really, they looked like they had that game well in hand, and the offense just stopped. Um, Oklahoma State had 150 yards of offense those first two drives. It had only like 235 of the rest of the game. That offense just buckled, and it and that's the unit for Oklahoma State that needs to lead the way. They returned eight starters on that side of the ball, instead of, including senior quarterback Spencer Sanders. Spencer was hurt most of the week, so you have to wonder how his shoulder bothered him. But he had a late pick, something that's really plagued him throughout his career, that allowed TCU to put that game into overtime. That should have been a touchdown and said it was a turnover, and TCU ultimately tied the game. This was a big one in the Big 12 standings. TCU is now unbeaten, has an inside track to the Big 12 title game. Oklahoma State has one loss in a really tough game with Texas this upcoming weekend. We could look back on this one at the end of the year as the reason why Oklahoma State didn't make the Big 12 championship. Crazy. All right. Well, it was a bad day to have the word state in your name. Here's the kind of state stat I know you want, not including a game where two state teams were playing each other. We call that state on state crime. Power five teams with state in the name went one and five yesterday with Michigan State being that lone victory. But we're talking about losers here. All that being said, let's discuss Penn, Penn State. Now, 0 and 9 against top 10 teams in the last five years. It was the big house beat down. Just another example of just how wide that gap is between the Nittany Lions and the Big Ten elite. Yeah, and I don't want to turn every one of these takes into a big picture thing, but I think you have to with Penn State. This is a team that in 2016 won the Big, 12 ti big Ten title. They beat Ohio State. They missed that on the playoffs, um, obviously in controversial fashion. But this was a program you thought was ready to take the next step under James Franklin. And frankly, they've plateaued. Like, they just haven't been able to do it. Jim Harbaugh got a ton of crap for his record and his career against Michigan State, Penn State, and Michigan early on. But we don't talk about the fact that James Franklin's 4-13 and 13 overall against Ohio State and Michigan in his career at Penn State. That's a, not a good record, obviously. And he gets paid, he has a 10-year, $75 million contract. He's one of the highest paid, best compensated coaches in college football. You expect more from this team. You expect them to pull up out some of these close games against top 10 teams because that's where Penn State wants to be and we're just not seeing it happen and this game wasn't even close and I don't think the game against Ohio State later this year is going to be close so Penn State still has a lot of climbing to do and that's something we expected to happen a long time ago when James Franklin first arrived on the scene at Penn State. Yeah, these big games are a good measuring stick and not quite there yet for Penn State. Meanwhile, NC State went on the road and lost to a still unbeaten Syracuse team in the Dome. And the loss, of course, was one thing, but it was a rough day on many fronts for the Pack, Chris. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, half the teams in college football lose every week, but not half the teams in college football lose their star quarterback ahead of the game. NC State announced prior to kickoff that starting quarterback Devin Leary is going to be out for the season with a injury. And that's just a devastating blow for NC State. They came into the year with top 10 expectations. This was a team that you thought might win the ACC. They lost a close one to Clemson, but you still thought with Devin Leary under center and a pretty dominant defense that NC State could go on to have a 10 win season, maybe make a New Year's Six Bowl, have a really special run. But that feels done after Devin Leary being out for the year. NC State's offense sputtered without him. Syracuse is now the darling of the ACC. And it's just a really rough year for an NC State program that had such high expectations. Devin Leary is kind of the nail in the coffin to what NC State fans probably hoped was going to be a special 2022 campaign. If you see an NC State fan, just give them a little hug. A little smile, something. Rough day for them yesterday. Great segment here, though, Chris. Thank you, as always, for all of the great information. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the 24-7 Sports YouTube page all season long for all things college football.